in June this year, I have released the following proposal. Let's hear the four main characteristics. First, the basic income, of course, amount 600 euros per month, 300 if less than 80. Uh, to give you an idea, 600 euros per month is less that, than the minimum income scheme in Belgium. But for somebody living alone, but it is more for two people living together. It's important to, to, to preside that. Two, social security benefits, mostly unemployment, sickness and pensions are preserved but of course reduced. For example, for unemployment benefits, <coughs> instead of 60% of the lost wage, it should be, for example, uh, 40%. But I keep all this uh, today social security system here and back. For people really, really, uh, I think we, we, we can discuss all the day what is really seeking a job, but that's another point. But for people who are supposed to really seeking a job, the conditional benefit of $250 per month, uh, euros per month, of course, added on top of the basic income. This proposal might sound strange for people from other countries, but in Belgium, we, are, uh, uh, we have a system for a long time that give you uh, a sort of unemployment benefit, even if you never worked. And then the first and perhaps the most important argument with, uh, with the discussion, uh, about the discussions with trade unions, I propose that, of course, the minimum hourly wage is preserved, is confirmed, and no work contract of less than 12 hours a week should be allowed. By the way, this rule exists already today in our system, but uh, <coughs> we observe that more and more contracts have less than uh, 10 hours a week. Why these characteristics and parameters? I say there are many arguments. I will focus now on two arguments. The first one, is that I strongly believe that we need, in all countries, at least the European countries, a kind of new social contract. The kind of contracts we, we got at the end of the Second World War, I think, for, a stand, for instance, at the National Insurance Act of 40, uh, 46 in the UK, the Ordonnance in France in 45, and the Social Solidarity Pact in 44 in Belgium. So I believe I won't be invited at the round table for this new social pact. So I made a compromise, compromise with myself, and I will, I will send this idea, this compromise, to the discussing parties. What about the trade unions first? The most important point, of course, is the incomes. All together, I, I say all together, these four basic characteristics of my proposal guarantee that nobody should have a lower income than today, at least in the lower two-thirds of the income distribution. And that each worker, even with a short-time contract, is sure to gain enough to be over the poverty line. That is not the case today. Another important point for the trade unions here in Belgium is that they today take part in the management, management of the welfare institution. <coughs> they are, for instance, member of the board of the National Employment Office, which is, in, which is in charge of the unemployment benefits. The question is, <coughs> with an income, basic income scheme, will she still participate? I strongly I firmly support the ID, the ID that they should be associated. They have to be associated in the management of the new system, even of the basic income uh, scheme. What about the employers? In the proposed scheme, they get 
First, no change in the labor hourly cost. No change in the labor hourly cost. The workers, if they choose to wear dress, which is supposed to be the choice of many workers, if they get a basic amount, a basic, uh, basic income, sorry, whose amount represents between one-fourth and one-third of the net wage of many workers today in Belgium will be more in attentive to their job. They, they will be more implicated in their job. If so, and that is important, and perhaps the most difficult thing today, what concerns the employers, the employers will have to agree that the 40 hours week won't be anymore the dominant standard. Uh, for some people, for some jobs, employers lie that the people work less than that. But for other jobs, they don't like people working shorter, shorter times, shorter hours. I think also that this income shame will, will, will smooth the social difficulties of the day. And I think, uh, sorry, I have a small, small problem here. Uh, yes. Ah uh, yes, the, the social difficulties, I'm sorry, related to the changes in the production processes. What about the state now, or the political side of this round table for a new <coughs> social pact? The state, should I dare to say the, the welfare state, huh? it, it's a bit out of fashion for some people to speak about welfare state, will gain, first, a major simplification of the income redistribution schemes, and I am convinced that they will get a new political and social legitimacy. Second argument I want to, to, to focus on is why not a more generous basic income? First of all, and I think it's for me one of the most important arguments, the amount of 600 euros per month can be financed mostly by existing budgets whose new assignation makes sense if converted in a basic income. I refer, of course, to the social security expenses, of course, but also, for instance, to the existing tax credits for children or other people without any income. Since everybody will get at least a basic income, even people under 18, these fiscal credits are no more necessary and can thus be used to finance this basic income. With an amount of 6 euros per month, we stay more or less in the existing budgets Logically, re, uh, logically related to uh, this new income scheme. Second argument, I think it's very difficult, most probably impossible, to anticipate how the labor market will behave under this new scheme. It is just better to start with a relatively small amount and to see what will happen. Third argument, it's a political argument, to try to gain support for this new social pact. If you want to win the support for more conservative people, it may not be an amount that is seen <coughs> sufficient to be lazy all along your life. It's the main argument for many people who don't understand what we are speaking about. I believe. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't share, of course, this argument, because I believe that most of the people stay working, even with a bigger amount. But in the first step, we have to gain a support for as many citizens and responsible people as possible. Last argument, I believe that, <coughs> that goes back to the origin of the idea of a basic income, it's also the the, the, the view of, uh, for example, André Goss. I believe that in Vibon is a life where everybody has a real funded opportunity 
to take part in three activities. Economic work, care activities, and of course, all other activities where people can express what they want to do for them and for the others on a non-profit basis. And the 600 euros per month have to support this part of all activities. Because for a long time, still for a long time, I think we need, of course, economic activities. Economic work. We need jobs in a traditional uh, view. And the, the, this basic income will support the three activities all together. More than ever, I am convinced that we need the basic income. And I am sure it will come faster than we can today believe. Thank you very much. So since this is a more, a more concrete um, uh, proposal, uh, and before the details slip your mind, uh, we're going to have a short discussion on this, and then we we'll focus on the more long-term discussion with Carl and David. Uh, so here we are. Are there any questions? Um, Philip, you, you talked about the uh, people not being in poverty. What poverty benchmark are you referring to? Is it the 0 0.6 of equivalised household income that's often referred to? No, I'm talking about the existing minimum income in Belgium, what we call revenu d'intégration. Huh? And it is indeed lower than the poverty line calculated by Silk uh, European uh, uh, standards. Uh, I know that's a discussion point, <coughs> but my first, my, I was really obsessed by the idea to release a proposal to be sure that anybody could uh, lose in the new system. Many people will get more, at least in the lower part eh, of the income distribution. Mm -hmm. I hope that uh, some people will, will lose and lose much, and more much than they, they, they fear even today. But <coughs> my idea was for the lower part of the income distribution, no loss, and if possible, and in many cases, again. Yes. Could you say something more about the need to maintain minimum wage and minimum hours, those provisions? I'm, I'm thinking that some people on the right might want to sign on to this, but only if you give them a reduction in regulation. Well, From their point of view, that would be one of the benefits of such a basic income scheme, is that you don't need to regulate as much mm -hmm. if you protect people with a... So, the idea here is first to address the arguments of the trade unions. They fear more than ever with Uber and all, all these uh, new developments, they feel more than ever that the possible basic income scheme would lead to a lowering of the wages, of the, uh, of the cost of the wages for the employers. So I have to address this argument. Otherwise, you will never get, in most European countries, you will never get the support of the trade. <coughs> and even with, with that, it will be difficult. Huh? Even with that, it will be difficult. So the first idea, we have to address this argument. Anyway, I think that uh, we need more flexibility on the labor. And that with the, with the basic income, flexibility, which is asked by the employers, can be also supported by the workers. If there is a, uh, a, social, uh, a basic income scheme, uh, that, those have the two main arguments here uh, uh, that we have to address. Um, I wonder whether well, you could talk about how far you think it is necessary to use this language of simplification and the inevitable necessity of flexibilizing the labor market. Uh, which seems sort of integral to your, to your proposal and, and for both in its elements and in, in its justification. Um, I don't know a lot about the labour market in Belgium, but it does sound rather worrying to think that we should accept as a norm that a work contract of, uh, of less than 12 hours is, is an acceptable 
uh, development. And I imagine, if you, as you were saying, there are three sorts of activities that most people would want to be involved in, in the good life. Presumably, people would want to have some kind of control uh, of, the, of, of access to paid work, and, and therefore also of the hours that they, 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 they're working. And so it seems to me, there's an, I slightly worry about the trade-off you seem to be presenting between security and basic income and flexibility in the labour market. So there's another version of flex security, right? Uh, and um, I just wonder if you could comment on that. And in connection with that, why is it so obviously a good thing to reduce the ceiling on unemployment benefits uh, from 60 to 40 percent? So, many questions. <laughs> uh, first one, it is a trade-off. I agree, it is a trade-off. I, I told you, I made a compromise with myself, trying to to understand the main uh, points of the two, of the different parties for a new social pact. Two, simplification today is necessary for the people. It's necessary for the people. Most people don't understand anymore our social security and redistribution system. And they have bad surprises. For example, I told you about uh, uh, child allowances for people with low income. So people has a mother working, has this child allowances, they start to work for six months, they keep the child allowances who are greater, and after six months she loses this child allowances. And the people don't understand. The simplification is, first of all, for the people themselves. I was working in the public center of for social action in Namur, as Maxim said. And every day, the social assistants, social workers, told me, in this case, I cannot tell the people if they will get a social an unemployment benefits of a sickness elements. That, that's, that's not possible to work in work in the art, uh, exception of the, 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 the term. It is not possible to work in this kind of society where people don't know what they will get if they work and, what, and they cannot explain what happens to them. So simplification is first of all for the people themselves. I don't think it will modify much for the employers. Employers. It's not simplification for the employers. So, last question. Uh, why 40% uh, um, for example for uh, unemployment benefits instead of 60%? But that's because people have already a basic income. And I have to finalize the, this total scheme. Huh? Uh, and new flexibility and uh, flexicurity uh, how to address this argument? I think that people, many people, want to work less and want, even for them, more flexibility. But in, the, uh, in this system, in the, today, that's a bad, a bad deal, of course, because they get only a short time contract, uh, uh, working uh, uh, not a full time work, partial work, and they don't get enough money, and they have to go to try to find money somewhere else in the system. With a basic income, I think that this kind of flexibility is acceptable. Okay, thank you. So. Sorry for my English, which is not perfect. Sorry. I'll go no, back to, to Philip's discussion. Uh, let's see proposal in general discussion, if you, if you want, no worries. Uh, so now we'll hear uh, from David. Um, who is going to present you his proposal of a micro tax on electronic payments? Hello, everybody. Um, as um, mentioned by Maxim, I uh, wrote, uh, it was eight years ago, a master thesis with uh, Philippe Van Parijs 
on the implementation of a tax on all transactions, but in the same time, the removal of the existing uh, tax system. Uh, now, I understand that today the, the framework is a bit different. We'll keep uh, the, the current tax system, um, we'll, we'll keep it, and in the same time, the, the purpose will be to finance uh, the basic income. Um, as yeah, one important fact is that in the past, uh, many transaction tax have been uh, implemented. Uh, you will see there the, the list of uh, all countries who raised in the past uh, transaction tax, or a tax on all transactions. Um, most of these countries are South American. Um, the nature of the tax was at first initially uh, temporary, but in many countries uh, such a tax have been renewed several times. Today, still three countries uh, have still such uh, taxation, Argentina, Venezuela, and uh, Colombia. Uh, most of the time, such taxation has been implemented in order to face a uh, financial crisis. Um, another point is uh, in terms of tax rate. The tax rate range from 0 to 2 to uh, 2%, and the tax base uh, was really depending from one country to another. Sometimes it was only on credit transactions. For some countries it was in debit transaction. For others it was on both. But uh, for all these countries there were many, many exemptions. Uh, for instance, saving accounts, uh, government owned accounts, same name accounts, uh, 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 purchase of stock, stock exchange movement. Many transactions were exempted. Um, but still, uh, I think uh, we can learn a lot from these experiences. And um, I will explain you a bit uh, uh, some key message of my uh, master thesis, which are still valid within the, the framework of uh, keeping the existing uh, tax, uh, tax system and, uh, and with the purpose to finance the, the basic income. So, one important message is the tax rate. It's quite important to have a tax rate as low as possible in order to reduce the economic distortion. Um, when you see that short, uh, it's quite interesting. It's, I've estimated uh, the ratio of the GDP to the total volume of transaction for specific countries. And you can see that, for instance, for UK, the ratio is pretty low, meaning there is a big potential to have a low uh, transaction tax rate. Um, during my, uh, at the time of my master thesis, I made some estimation, so it was in, uh, in, in 2009, um, and um, I've estimated that in order to have a review neutral, that means that the purpose of the transaction tax was to, to raise the same amount of uh, taxes than the current tax system. So to have such transaction tax, review neutral transaction tax, we need a 1.4% uh, transaction tax rate. Uh, but for sure, as of the moment we'll implement such a tax on all transactions, uh, the economic agents will change their behavior, will adapt themselves to the new situation, and uh, the decline in the volume of transaction uh, will uh, depend on the elasticity of the transaction for the transaction cost. At the time, again, of my master thesis, I made some simulation and in case the transaction decline, transaction volume declined by 30 percent, we uh, need a 1.9 transaction tax rate. Another uh, important point is um, if you check a bit uh, the, of, if the, 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 the overview of the total volume of transaction. So this is for the US. Um, you can see that it's quite surprising, but only a bit more than 10% of the total volume of the transaction are uh, final or intermediate, intermediate goods and services. The rest of the transaction uh, are made on the financial market. <coughs> so in case you implement such a taxation, in fact, you will shift the burden, the tax burden from the physical to the financial assets. Another important point is fairness. In the sense that uh, you need to communicate on the fairness of your tax once you implement it. 
uh, or the right people with challenge it. Um, and when you check that chart, it's also quite interesting because it's again for the US, but uh, there is a blue line and burgundy line. And the blue line represents the ratio of the net worth on income. The burgundy represents the ratio of the transaction volume on income. And you can see that for lower and medium uh, income individuals, there is, um, a, there is a proportionality between net worth and income or between transaction and income. But for highest income individuals, it's not only a proportionality, it's a strong progressivity um, between net worth income and transaction tax and income. But this progressivity is even higher when you uh, speak about transaction volume. So you can check there the, the Burgett line. So still, um, by I, uh, we have just seen some some strong point of the transaction tax. Now, uh, in the past, uh, in many South American countries, this tax has been implemented. Uh, there is that there, there were some economic uh, distortion, um, and we have to keep that in mind uh, if we want to implement such a taxation. Um, first is the cascading effect, what I call cascading effect is the fact that it's not, the fin it's not only the final consumer who will pay the cost of, of the tax, it's all company on the value chain. Um, and so in that case, the tax rate can implicitly increase uh, quite quickly. It's also the fact that um, people will, and in the past it was like this you know, in South America, people tried to uh, to avoid the tax uh, by leaving the banking network, and they they can do it by using more cash, by using alternative money, uh, alternative currency, or by developing informal economy. Um, we can say that there is four categories of company will be. And much more impacted. Uh, it's the company of the first category are the company located far on the value chain. So this is due to the cascading effect. The company involved in many transactions, meaning the company will need a high turnover in order to realize a small margin. The company in some business based volumes. Um, the transaction tax is also a tax uh, we will tax the move of capitals. Uh, whether or not there is a creation of wealth. So the entity who don't do any profit, who don't have any profitability will also be taxed. So there, these are the company below the break-even point and the company with the high saving and debt ratio just because we observe uh, in South America that the spread between the borrowing and the lending rates increase with such taxation. So the company using a lot of borrowing and savings uh, are also impacted. So as a conclusion, I will say that um, uh, in a world where everything uh, starts to be digitized and will be digitized, uh, I think it's a really it's a good thing to, to think about uh, the digitization also of the tax collection. Um, but and we have seen during the presentation there are some some uh, there's a few really uh, good points about that tax. Um, but by implementing such a tax, we will still keep in mind uh, the, some point of attention that we have noticed and to learn uh, the lessons from, from, from the past experiences. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, a quick help in the cl a clarification. And so, the, the key point here, and that's uh, is, and so. One of the things which uh, uh, David computed is that in order to get the total volume of taxation we have in Belgium in all sorts of forms, all you need, if the tax base is unchanged, is one, uh, a tax rate of 1.4% on all payments, all electronic payments, whatever form. Huh? Just a very small rate. Now, of course, the tax base is elastic and you take, need to take that in, into account. And so the cascading effect, the best way to understand it is by comparing to the VAT, which you are familiar with. In the case of VAT, what is being taxed at each stage is only the value that is being added by uh, each uh, stage in the production. Whereas in the case of this tax, of course, you pay on the whole of the value 
and that uh, the and the component and, and that's a cascading uh, effect and so and the relevance of uh, all this as uh, Eno will also confirm is that in the Swiss uh, referendum debate uh, Zig uh, was one of the people and two people at the Polytechnic in uh, Zurich proposed this as the best way of funding a basic income in the long term and uh, and that's why I thought it was interesting to feed that into our debate today. Yeah, and just that in our case, if we decide to keep the existing tax system, for sure the tax rates can be really smaller than that 1.4%. That was, yeah, in the, in, the, in the frame of my master thesis, it was totally different. It was, yeah, to have a revenue neutral taxation, it's not a good deal. Many of you know that Alaska has uh, the closest thing to a basic income that exists in the world today. Uh, some of you might also know that it's under attack right now. Uh, let me give you some of the history of how we got there. I think Alaska can be a great model for what we can do. We can build on this model and make it, and make it better and stronger. Let me give you some of this history then. It begins uh, in the late 1950s when Alaska was becoming a state. And in 1959, it ratified its constitution. It became the first state in the United States uh, to say that all resources existed for the benefit of the people of the state. Uh, now, that is not exactly an assertion of ownership of those resources, but that's the closest we've come yet. And this is already in the constitution. But then, following the constitution, uh, there's, there's a... Uh, there's a controversy between the state government and the federal government is they're trying to iron out what is going to happen to Alaska's land, because the vast majority of it was owned by the federal government. So, well, some of this should be state and some should be federal. And, uh, and they were in some negotiations about, well, which land should be state and which should be federal. But then in 1962, uh, a geologist went to meet with the governor at the time in the governor's mansion in Juneau. And he says, you know, I've been looking at the geology of this state, and I, it looks like there's a really good chance that I would think that under the oil in the northernmost, I'm oh, sorry, under the ground uh, in the northernmost part of Alaska, there's a really good chance that there's oil there. And so the governor then calls up the feds and he says, you know, I think I can solve, I think I can solve this impasse we've been at with what the federal and which land should be federal and state. You can take all these nice trees and things down here in the center. You can make a big park out of that. I'll take just this tundra, all this worthless tundra here on the top. We'll take that for the state. And he did that. And what do you know? Um, now, in 1967, oil was, in fact, discovered right where the governor thought it was going to be in 1962. And it was discovered on state land, in a state that already had declared that the land of the state and all the resources of the state existed for the benefit of the people. That was in, that was, um, in the state. Now, and of course, at the same time, there is a basic income guarantee movement going on in the United States, seemingly having little in, uh, influence in Alaska. Uh, but in 1976, Jay Hammond was elected, was elected uh, governor of the state of Alaska. And he had already instituted something like this on a very small level when he was a borough president in a small area. And he was very interested in creating something that gave a dividend to the people from the, from the oil resources. Uh, and he got the PD, the APF, the Alaska Permanent Fund, created in 1976, when one small portion of that revenue was going to go into that fund. But then it took him until his last year of uh, his last year in office um, to actually determine what the fund was going to do with this money. So the money just sat there growing for six or well, eight years. Uh, six years. I guess he was elected in '74. Yeah, it was two. 74 and then 76 the APF was created and uh, in 1982 they created the permanent fund dividends. These are actually two different things, the APF and the PFD. Uh, the APF is the fund and it is in the Alaska state constitution and cannot be changed without a constitutional amendment, but the PDF was created simply by an act of the legislature. 
So the dividend is a little more vulnerable than the fund. Now in 1998, they had a referendum to redirect funds from the APF to something else other than the dividend, and it was defeated by a vote of about 80% to 20. Now this is in the United States, where we don't get votes of 80-20. Uh, it's very rare to get 80% of the people voting on the same side of anything. Okay, in Alabama you can get 95% of people voting against a black president, sure, but, uh, uh, but in, uh, well, and that's only white people actually. Uh, um, uh, but uh, on most things, it's really hard to get 80% of the people behind. So it's very popular. In 2008, um, with a supplement out of that year's budget surplus, it reached a high of $3,269. 2010, it was $1,884. Uh, 1, it's been under attack recently because the governor wants to use that money for something else. Um, and he actually used a trick this year to reduce the size of the fund, cut it about in half of what it would have been by uh, vetoing the authorization bill to distribute the, uh, to distribute the money in, in uh, the form of a dividend as the state has. So the legislature is still behind the dividend and there's a lawsuit going on where there, you can actually change something like this by veto. So uh, it remains up in the air, but it is for the first time really under serious attack in all these years. Now, uh, how it works, about one-eighth of the oil revenue deposited into the Alaska Permanent Fund, of the oil revenue that Alaska has made, about one-eighth of it has gone into the fund. And that has produced th th this dividend, one-eighth. Um, now, Governor Hammond actually wanted it to be one-half. So you can, imagine, like, you can imagine multiplying that figure, multiplying that uh, Roughly two thousand dollars. It would have been this year without been cut. Um, multiplying that, um, multiplying that by four, getting that nearly to eight thousand dollars per person, per man, woman, and child per year. Had Governor Hammond <coughs> what he wanted, um, and um, uh, the. Um, and Alaska actually gets a relatively small portion of, it captures a relatively small portion of its oil revenue, about half what Norway does. So you could, you could double that again um, if you imagine them actually doing better. Now, the state cannot spend the principle of the APF. That is constitutionally protected without a constitutional amendment. But the state does decide what happens with the revenue. And after inflation protection, the ret returns are shared to all citizen residents um, and actually, it's, it's all permanent residents. So uh, if you as a non-citizen are going, uh, are working in Alaska for a certain amount of time, you can get this. Uh, and it's called the permanent fund dividend. Now, um, it's been successful. It's hugely popular. It is one of the factors that, is, uh, that has helped Alaska become more equal while most of the rest of the United States is becoming less equal economically. It's not even thought of as a welfare policy. It's not thought of as something Alaska does to help its poor, but of course, um, because they have it, the people in Alaska are less poor, and it's, I, I tell you, if you're a single mother with, with, uh, with three kids, and you get a check for $2,000 for each person in your family in, in October, that means a lot more to you if you're someone living on the edge of poverty. It means a lot more to you than it does something if you're a, uh, a $200,000 a year two-parent uh, family where they're both working. Uh, so it is much more significant. It does help make it become a much better place. Um, and uh, uh, so it is a significant policy. It's not thought of as something to combat equality. It's thought something that we do because we all share ownership in this thing. Alaska's oil. Now, uh, and it has influenced uh, other countries. Other countries with sovereign wealth funds are talking about it. More and more countries are creating sovereign wealth funds. Uh, Singapore has something like a wealth partaking scheme. Uh, um, Iran tried something like this and screwed it up. Uh, Mongolians were demonstrating for something like this, and then the, the, the resource prices collapsed, and uh, not much has been going on in Mongolia in the last few years. Um, now, so I take away from this from two books that I helped to edit on, on the Alaska model. I take away six lessons from this experience that I think the basic income movement can benefit from. One of those is resource dividends are popular and they work. 
Um, when it was proposed, when, when the Alaska dividend was first proposed, it was not the most popular thing to do with the funds from the uh, Alaska Permanent Fund. But once it, was in once it was created, it became hugely popular. People saw the value of it, that this isn't just for someone else. This is for me. This is helpful to me and my children. This is something good for me. And it's large enough to be significant. It's large enough to be something that people care about. These things work, and they become popular. People can rally around this idea. Now, another one is that you don't have to be resource rich to have a resource dividend. It is almost entirely, at the moment, it is export, uh, exporting, uh, natural resource exporting countries or regions that have resource dividends. Um, but, and, and we think of this, we think, oh, Alaska can do that because they're so rich with oil. But this, these things are actually not true. Um, that Alaska, Alaska is not terribly rich as states go. It was, it was depending on the price of oil, it, it sometimes is the richest state. Right now, last I checked, it was ranked about 10th. Um, so it's, it's uh, richer than average, but not huge, it's not hugely average. And it doesn't use that much of its oil revenue for the dividend. You know what it did with most of its oil revenue? Uh, it did the stupidest thing it could do. It, gets, it has this temporary windfall of money. And what does it do is it gets rid of basically all its other taxes, which means that when the oil money runs out, as it event, evidently will someday, they're going to have no tax revenue, and they're going to be scrambling to get those taxes. Had they kept those taxes in place, they could have used this for a much greater revenue. But also, um, when you think about this, is that Oil is really still a small part of Alaska's economy. It's a very significant part, but there's a lot of other things going on that aren't being taxed like this. And the most important thing here to realize that you don't have to be resource rich to have a resource dividend is because the difference between a resource rich country and a resource poor country, or what we call resource rich and a resource poor country, is the resource rich company, countries are rich in the things, that, the resources that governments typically sell. And the resource poor countries are rich in the resources that governments typically give away. And that's what governments do, is they give away resources to people who are already rich, who often improve them. Uh, and then they sell them back to us, and they capture not only the benefits of their improvement, but the entire rental value of all those resources that they got, that they got for uh, uh, that they got just for owning a scarce resource because they own it and we don't. And if we start thinking about all these other resources as being part of the people's endowment that should be managed by the government in the name of the people and not privatized unless they can be sold at a profit where it's, it's a true profit of what we're giving up in a shared resource is really worth the money we're getting in what the companies are paid for, not in some nebulous thing where the companies say, well, you give me this for free and then I'll create jobs. Um, well, you pay for it and then you create the jobs. Um, if, uh, if, I had a if you were a farmer, imagine if you were a farmer and, somebody's, uh, uh, and you, had, you had three kids and you wanted to benefit the farm, your kids with the farm. You wouldn't sit, let some company just have your farm for free because they said then, well, maybe I'll give some of your kids jobs. Just give me your farm for free when you die. Uh, and I'll maybe give your kids jobs, maybe I won't, but I'll do my best. I'll, like, that's what we do with the endowment for our children. Um, and so, and, and so we got to think about all these things we're giving away. The government typically gives away land. It gives away water. It gives away clean air, forests, uh, the minerals, uh, the monetary system, where we let the banks create most of the money for free and get that. The broadcast spectrum is recently estimated that the broadcast spectrum in the United States has a rental value. That's not the value of the profits that the cell companies and the television companies and the radio companies and everybody else. <laughs> not the profits and the value that they're adding to it. The rental value of just owning a scarce piece of that, of that broadcast spectrum that you could rent to someone else. The broadcast spectrum in the United States alone, $300 billion a year. And the government gives that away to companies uh, in the exchange that they'll do something like uh, work in the public interest, which usually means being willing to uh, 
uh, put up a special announcement if there's a nuclear war. Uh, um, I remember those tests when I was a kid. And, uh, um, and uh, yeah, took dedication to tornado warnings and a public affairs program which usually airs at about 5.30 in the morning on Sunday. Uh, that's what they do for something worth $300 billion that they're getting for free. What we need to be doing is charging them up the nose for this stuff and making some money off this. Now, um, of course, this will lead to another question, but I'll get to it. Okay, look for opportunities. Now, we have the Alaska dividend because, largely because this guy used the power of his office. He was the right man at the right place at the right time. Uh, and he used the power of the office and eight years of dealing to try to create this thing, and he managed to do it uh, in his last year in office. Uh, we have people like this sometimes in government, uh, sometimes Sometimes we have them in activist groups and other communities, but uh, it takes people looking for the opportunities and pushing it through. And boy, there's a great opportunity right now. We've got we've got people concerned about uh, about global warming and uh, cap and dividend or tax and dividend. Some of the most popular strategies. We got people concerned about inequality and about the need for banking reform and activism for activism for greater equality. All of this is an opportunity for the basic income movement. Um, there are many opportunities now, but of course, you know, we have to think about okay. You're going to sell these resources. You're going to sell these resources. You get the idea that um, you get the idea that well, if we sell them, then uh, then then maybe we'll just want to sell all of them, and 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 things will be worse. Um, now, and, and the the environmental degradation and so forth will be worse. I, I am, uh, and I think that. Is it's although that's possible. This is possible one thing you can think of, but I think that's that's it's really wrong because look at how bad the environment has gotten over the last ten thousand years. How much worse it has gotten, and nobody ever got a dividend. Okay, the the, the Maori got to New Zealand thousand years ago, and they hunted the the moa to death. Okay, I never got a moa dividend. Uh, uh, none of us got these dividends. Uh, the, uh, all, uh, for almost all of the resource exploitation, exploitation around the world, never got. Do you realize that in your fat cells, as well as in the fat cells of animals as, uh, as far away as penguins in the Arctic, is uh, rubber from our tires in all of our fat cells around the world? No, penguins are not getting a rubber. They're not getting a rubber dividend. Um, maybe they should be, but they're not. So all you can just is that because once you assert this power to say, we can charge you for these resources. You're asserting, you're not really taxing, you're asserting ownership, that these are my resources. These resources belong to the people. And resources that, when, what comes along with ownership is not just the right to charge for them, but the right to make decisions about them and to regulate them and say, no, we don't want you to sell all these resources. So when you think like that with the people on this, you gotta start thinking like a monopolist. You gotta think like a monopolist, but okay, but not just any monopolist, okay? Because a monopolist, a monopolist raises their price to get higher revenue. Monopolists don't just sell all they can. Uh, that would be a silly monopolist. They just lower the price and sell all they can until they run out of everything. Monopolists raise their price to get the highest price, the profit maximizing price. But a real smart monopolist, in some cases, thinks like this guy. Now, who's that? Okay, that guy, um, that guy about 30, 40 years ago was the, was the highest paid entertainer in the world. His name is Johnny Carson. He had a monopoly on the late night talk show audience. At that time, he entirely dominated. Now there's a whole bunch of late night talk show guys, but he really dominated. He could have gone anywhere with his audience. And so he got himself to being the highest paid performer. And then he's like, you know, I don't like working five days a week. My time is valuable. I want to work four days a week. Oh, and I like tennis. I'm going to go to Wimbledon every year, and you're going to give me like six weeks off to go to Wimbledon, and then I want four more weeks in the winter. And he raised his price. He could have made more money. He could have made more money, but he realized that his resource in and of itself, unsold, was valuable. That raising his price beyond the profit maximized price, raising his rate beyond the profit maximizing rate, 
would, uh, would act was actually better for him. And once we do that, once we take charge and think of the earth is the people's endowment, and we are seek, taking ownership of this, we can look at our resources this way. Once we don't have to give them all away to hope for this crumbs of little jobs, but actually getting a big chunk of money up front when we give these out, we can think that we can actually afford to save a whole bunch of this stuff. And we got bigger parks and better parks and a healthier atmosphere, and we can make the polluters pay for it. Okay, thanks a lot.